You're watching the endlessly tasty phrasing of Carl Miner, bluegrass wonderkin turned Nashville studio ace. I first met Carl in 2007 when he was a winner of the National Guitar Flat Pick Championships at the Walnut Valley Music Festival. The festival takes place each year in September in Winfield, Kansas, and hosts a smorgasbord of musical competitions, from finger-picked guitar to fiddle to hammer dulcimer. In bluegrass lingo, the term flat picking is simply a way of differentiating players who use guitar picks from those who use fingers. Doc Watson was the Django Reinhardt of the style, bursting onto the scene as part of the folk revival of the early 60s and instantly synthesizing all its elements into the special sauce of Celtic and blues influences that we now recognize as bluegrass guitar. Since that time, flat pick guitarists have been the preeminent tastemakers of the bluegrass genre. Directly inspired by Doc's breakthrough, Norman Blake, Tony Rice, Clarence White, and Dan Crary were like the four bass pairs of Doc's double helix of technical and melodic virtuosity. Altogether, this crew of five originators set the structure from which decades of musical creativity would grow. Meeting Carl at Winfield that year was a happy accident. Carl had competed seriously in the late 90s when he was still a teenager, placing second in 1998 and winning overall in 1999. In 2007, he dusted off his competition chops like the rest of us re-up our gym memberships after the winter and delivered what I thought was the classiest performance of the day. A reworking of George Gershwin's 1924 classic Oh, Lady Be Good. Which was simultaneously fanciful, yet still respectful of Winfield's traditional bluegrass roots. Since that time, he transformed those bluegrass connections into a successful career in touring and session work. He played both guitar and mandolin on six tracks on Taylor Swift's Red album, toured for a year with Mumford & Sons and Fiona Apple, and this year passed a mini milestone by clocking his 100th Nashville recording session of 2015. The Nashville community is really fascinating. Carl is on a short list of a few dozen seasoned studio players who collectively record most of the riffs you hear on modern country productions. This includes mega buck headlight smashers, as well as a bustling indie country scene that would give Williamsburg a run for its money and its haircuts. Hurt so bad. Nashville's renown as a metropolis of music production is of course legendary. Chet Atkins modernized what is essentially the current system of highly skilled players creating lush arrangements practically in real time. Depending on the budget involved, this can mean tackling as many as four or five songs in a single three-hour session and laying down a complete track in as little as a half an hour. That's 30 minutes from first laying eyes on the chart to writing the riffs, memorizing the structure, and recording the finished track. Players are typically given just the skeletal structure of the chord progression. The specifics of the riffs, rhythm parts, solos, and fills that are being played are all composed on the spot by the players. In this town, it's one of the few musical scenarios doing a session where producers and artists will never ask you if you can do or know how to do something. They'll just assume. Is, give me a Tony Rice lick on the front of this, and they, I've never been, and people will say that not knowing nothing about my past or what I know or right. what I do, they'll assume that because I'm in a studio, in a major studio in Nashville, that I better know what that right. means. Like, give me some Eddie Van Halen sounding thing. That happens in too. In LA, they're gonna know. Well, here then, the, the, I get, the, I've gotten that request here too. <laughs> really? Absolutely. Like, the ability to do this and still be fresh and interesting all the time means developing a deep vocabulary in a variety of styles. Carl's ability to spin enchantingly pretty rhythm parts was evident even in our first Winfield interview.
Carl commented that a lot of this stuff doesn't require Winfield level skills, but if you've ever done any recording, these kinds of parts are deceptively tricky. delicate string skipping smooth, pick attack and tone need to be perfectly consistent. And fretting accuracy needs to be precise enough to let each chord tone ring for as long as possible. Powering all this is one of the most unique picking techniques I've ever filmed. When I met Carl and Steve in 2007, I didn't know what I didn't know, so I wasn't prepared to recognize the kind of movements they were making. I reviewed their footage long enough to label it diatonic or pentatonic or whatever, and I stuck it on a hard drive. I finally dug it up again this year, and I was expecting the usual suspects. Upward pick slanting, downward pick slanting, or combinations of both. But instead, I was amazed at what I saw. This is, of course, cross-picking, the curved picking motion that exists in an alternate universe outside of pick slanting. In cross-picking, the pick stroke both begins and ends above the strings. And this lets you move from one string to another without hitting anything. In the original interview, I asked Carl my usual battery of ascending and descending scale questions because that was how I would determine what pick slant a player was using. But in Carl's case, the questions all failed. No matter whether he was playing three notes per string, or two, the picking motion was exactly the same. It wasn't really up or down, it was curved. This incredible consistency of movement, where one picking motion handles all picking combinations, is actually pretty rare, even in bluegrass. For example, here's bluegrass ace Brad Davis. Brad is a very obvious downward pick slanter, who also uses rest stroke sweeping to get across the strings when ascending. In fact, he wrote a book on the subject where he calls this the double down technique. This is basically gypsy style or Eric Johnson Ingve style, downward pick slanting and sweeping, but applied to bluegrass playing. And it sounds great. Now here's Brian Sutton. Brian is a masterful two-way pick slanter with a preference for up. You'll frequently see him rest stroke against a lower string, completely the opposite of Brad, with a pronounced upward pick slant while waiting for a legato phrase to finish on a higher string. Then we have this movement. That's the telltale forearm rotation of two-way pick slanting that lets him switch temporarily to downward pick slanting so he can switch strings after an upstroke. But this, again, is a temporary movement. Most of Brad's scalar lines are arranged to strictly work with upward pick slanting. You can see the pick slant here is up all the way. So not all bluegrass technique is created equal, and the style can still be played at an expert level with pick slanting if you spend the time to arrange phrases that work with your preferred pick slant while avoiding those that don't. But there are some lines that simply won't work any other way. This is Beaumont Rag, a bluegrass standard that is kind of a litmus test for cross-picking movement because of its strictly one note per string construction. With only one note per string, there really is no way to fake this. Either you rearrange the line to 
to use more notes per string, or you figure out a way to get from one string to another. After playing only one note on each of them, without it all falling apart. It was the solution to this kind of string switching that was the big bang movement for modern bluegrass guitar. Of course, Doc Watson was the original cross picker. The pronounced curvature of his pick strokes is unmistakable here. And this makes perfect sense. Translating complicated fiddle tunes to guitar very quickly leads to picking combinations like Beaumont that would be awkward or impossible for pick slanters. Which is why when Doc arrived on the scene, his ability to play these kinds of rolling patterns sparked a revolution. This is Black Mountain Rag, and it's one of many trademark Doc Watson cold fusion moments of technical innovation that jump-started the flat picking style. This rolling pattern here, this is a Doc signature, and it's essentially impossible with pick slanting techniques. But using cross picking, Doc handles this with ease even at blistering speeds. Observing Doc's playing from this angle, you'd never know how he was managing. And it's only in rare close-up footage like this that we can see his real magic at work. Now to be clear, bluegrass players only use the term cross-picking to refer to arpeggio licks played one note per string. But I'm using it to refer to the curved picking movement itself because it is this movement which is the real technical innovation of bluegrass and which makes its trademark cross-picking licks possible in the first place. So even though this here is a scalar lick, this is still cross-picking because of the curvature of the pick stroke that carries us up and out of the strings on every note. In fact, if you look down at Carl's hands when he's doing this, you'll see it. grabbed this shot at a pickin' party, that's actually what they call it, at Adam Wright's house, who is himself a former Winfield winner. Looking down from above like this, you can see that Carl actually catches air on every pick stroke. There's actual space between the pick and the strings before and after every note, even at speedy tempos like this. This is really, really cool, and not something we see at all in pick slanting techniques in rock and jazz, where the pick only clears on every other pick stroke. Here's another great shot. The totally uniform curvature here is really obvious. This is a lick that could be done with downward pick slanting and a little sweeping, but Carl's doing it with cross picking, so every pick stroke clears. What's interesting, and what I didn't know, is that Carl actually does have a pick slanting technique. Did you catch that? It's upward pick slanting. At these faster speeds, 16th note triplets, he dispenses with the cross picking movement and uses more of a straight line upward pick slanting technique. This only works on licks like this one, where the last note on every string is a downstroke. We actually spent some time working on this into a Paul Gilbert style pattern just to make the point. Exactly. What's interesting is that this upward pick slant does crop up in his cross picking technique. It's still cross picking, but it's being done with an upward slanted pick. What's also interesting is that this is not always the case. Here, there really appears to be no pick slant at all, but the cross picking curvature remains. And this is a clue to how the movement works. Think about it. With wrist deviation, if you don't have a pick slant, you either hit the upper string or the lower one. 
It's only when you use an upward pick slant that the downstrokes clear. And a downward pick slant makes the upstrokes clear. But extension doesn't need a pick slant to clear the strings because it already goes like this. You just extend the wrist and the downstroke lifts up out of the strings. Same perflection, but with a twist, literally. If you flex to this point, you can't go any further because the guitar's in the way. In order to actually clear on the upstroke, you have to supinate the forearm just a little bit. And that lets the flexion movement continue so we can get out of the strings again. This is the formula that I use on one of the cross-picking methods I've been able to get so far. In this approach, you have extension on the downstroke and flexion and rotation on the upstroke. When you look at the wide shot, it's not immediately obvious why the forearm is moving around. But close up, you can see it. Every time the pick passes the string on the upstroke, you have a little bit of rotation here to get the pick out of the strings again. The downstroke is the reverse. You rotate back down to the string while extending. And then when you pass the string, you just keep extending. So the movement is basically this. And there's your cross-picking curvature. How are you generating that curve? Now in Carl's case, when we tried to exaggerate the movement to figure out what was going on, sure enough, some rotation appears on the upstroke. This looks to be similar to the formula that I'm using. You get the forearm twisting on the upstroke like that? Yes. You do? Yeah. When you do the downstroke, what, is this movement happening? Uh, if anything, it's probably more this movement. That, that's what I mean. Strokes. Yeah, yeah. That's extension. A, yeah, a little, a little bit. Just a very, Just a very small tiny amount, amount, though. It's popping up. That's the turning. Yeah, there's a little bit of extension. A tiny happening. little bit of a extension. A tiny little bit, for sure. Just look at this movement. It's so simple, so powerful, and so attractive. It just looks like something we should all be able to do. Sure, a pure pick slanting technique may have more in the raw speed category. And you can always use those techniques when you need them, like Carl does. But in no way would I call this slow. And there are plenty of times, even in aggressive rock and metal riffing, where this kind of dexterity would come in really handy. not having to worry about picking patterns, numbers of notes per string, or even whether you're using a downstroke or an upstroke. None of that. The right hand just magically following along with whatever the left hand wants to do, it's what we were told picking technique was supposed to be. And when it didn't work that way for a lot of us, we gave up a little on that dream. Along the way, we found other solutions, like legato and sweeping. And then we learned that with the little pick slanting know-how, we could engineer our way to playing most things most of the time. But the way Carl does cross-picking shows us that the original dream could still be very real.